Hello everyone, welcome back to another edition of Trek Yards, the go-to place for all things over-explained in the universe of Star Trek. I'm one half of your Trek Yards command team, Captain Foley. And I am the other half of Team Trekkers. Come on, all cookings, welcome back, everyone. Um, Stuart. Yes? What are you doing, exactly? I'm employing John Cena's cloaking device. You can't see me. Um... Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I can. Plain as day, you just look silly, Stuart. Oh man, this thing must be malfunctioning. Anyways, the cloaking devices in Star Trek work much, much better. Uh, Let's yeah. talk about those instead. Yeah, that's a good plan, Stuart. Good, good plan. Just, just what are they? The different <laughs> types, and even how they work. There could be some techno babble in this one, guys. <sighs> Just saying. It's good to know, Babble. Uh, yeah, that seems like a safer bet, Stuart, considering all of our viewers out there love Star Trek, and I hear to learn about this very subject a bit more than the do-at-home DIY kit. So since you are again visible, Captain, let's get this episode underway. A cloaking device, also known as a cloaking system or invisibility screen, is a form of stealth technology that uses the selective bending of light and other forms of energy to render a starship or other object completely invisible to the electromagnetic spectrum, most sensor systems, and even the naked eye. Mm. It has been encountered in various forms over the history of Star Trek. Yes, but I think we'll focus primarily on the Romulan and Klingon versions of this specific, or for a specific episode. These devices were most commonly employed on starships, often for the purpose of subterfuge, allowing a vessel to move unhindered by unaware opposition. However, cloak devi cloaking devices have also been used for uh, various other purposes, such as hiding uh, individuals, stations, bombs, mines, uh, and spying technology, and in some cases even entire planets. Usually, the power consumption required has been a severe limiting factor, making even cloaking smaller starships difficult and limiting or even eliminating the ability to simultaneously use other major systems such as weaponry, shields, or in some cases even warp drive. Mm. However, with the correct technical expertise, it is possible to not only cloak very large objects, but as the technology advanced, other systems became operable even when cloaks were being utilized. In most cases, to be able to function correctly, the cloaking device needed to be tied into the ship's deflector grid and shield emitters. And then, when activated, the cloaking device projects a cloaking field, also known as a cloaking shield, around the entire vessel in the very same way the defensive energy shields are projected around the ship to protect them from enemy fire. These cloaking shields can, in some instances, be expanded to encompass other ships. Uh, or even reconfigured in their geometry to mask emissions when under a wide variety of special circumstances, such as nebulas, ion storms, and various forms of other radiation just present in space. Most vessels could not use their defensive deflector shields when cloaked. Mm. Some ships, like the Klingon D-12 class, were vulnerable to attack for two seconds when their shields automatically dropped as the cloaking field formed. Some ships, like Shinzon's Scimitar from Star Trek Nemesis, mm. had a more advanced cloaking mm. technology and, in fact, had both primary and secondary deflector shield emitters that could keep the shields raised even when the cloak was active. But other limitations surrounding the cloak included... Much reduced warp speeds were active due to the large drain of power that the system required. Additionally, the ship needed to decloak when firing, which was a serious tactical problem as you're not only exposing your position to the enemy vessel, but you're also usually vulnerable to attack when the cloak was deactivating or engaging as the defensive shielding systems would drop on most ships, as they switch over to the deflector grid use was changing using the same emitter systems. Even simple things like communications would be affected by their cloak, even though it was possible to communicate through a cloak and shield, although doing so would broadcast a position to enemy targets. Not very effective then. So a cloak vessel was generally in communication blackout or running silent when cloaked to avoid detection. Another reason that ships usually were required to decloak before firing was because of the unique properties of the cloaking field itself, in that any beam or projectile weapon fired from inside the field would interact with it in unpredictable ways. From disappearing and rematerializing thousands of kilometers away, to dimensionally smearing within the envelope only to exit back inside the field and strike the ship. In practice, that meant that any commander who was foolish enough to fire while cloaked was almost certain to A, not hit his target, and B, was likely to end up destroying his own ship. I just want to throw in that I'm not one of those commanders aforementioned. I know not to. <laughs> 
So as a safety procedure, the designers of the systems would install a software routine safeguard that would disable the weapon systems while the ship was cloaked, preventing anyone from accidentally firing. If, yes, pretty essential. You can imagine the testing phase was like, fire! Well, we lost that ship. Right, try it again. <laughs> ship after ship. Most cloaking systems employed quantum teleportation, which simply actively transported both matter and energy from the outside of one side of the cloaking envelope to the other side. Ooh. This was generally done very fast and precisely, so that all but the most sensitive of sense technology could detect it. Matter and energy that was produced inside of the cloaking envelope from sources like the impulse engine uh, were temporarily stored within this said field. An extremely small fraction of the total energy flux from the surrounding space, approximately 0.003, approximately, percent, uh, was allowed to penetrate the cloak to allow for sublight navigation. The major components in most cloaking systems included a plasma manifold, plasma frequency conditioner, a cloak quantum teleportation waveform accelerator, defensive shield energy diverter, emitter monitor, and the actual cloaking field emitters. Generally, as mentioned earlier, those would entail the entire ship's deflection grid, however. Mm. The final essential piece of equipment is a blast debris catcher ahead of the accelerator, which is designed to minimize damage to the plasma systems if there is an internal structural failure. The entire cloaking assembly of a standard Klingon bird of prey measures in at 12.31 meters in length and 2.17 meters in diameter, and most of the equipment housing were generally forged from tritanium and kelandide. The shield energy diverter channels a small portion of system energy to the defensive shield grid embedded within the hull plating. This can in some instances create a defensive energy shield layer through the cloaking emitters themselves, although this shielding is usually confined to a smaller envelope than that produced by the cloak itself, and is nowhere near as effective as the full defensive shield systems when the cloak is actually deactivated. The Romulan's cloaking device, as seen in the original series, was much smaller than the Klingon's later design, however, measuring it at only one meter in height. These units consisted of a large glowing sphere above a circular base and a cylindrical unit that protruded from the top. This unit simply plugged into a bay on the vessel, sometimes located in main engineering, but usually on most Romulan ships, this was a separate room that required security clearance to access and usually had guards posted outside. The cloaking unit then connected directly into the main deflector grid control assembly. Mm. These units were early examples of cloaking technology and not entirely perfect. However, despite its small size and portability, the device could be used to render a small ship that was several hundred meters long completely invisible. It was these smaller Mark II cloaking units that the Romulans exchanged with the Klingons during their brief alliance and technology exchange in the year 2267. These Mark II units were a huge advancement over the previously tested Mark Ones that Romans had been employing for some time. These new systems allowed for cloaked vessels to travel at a low warp speed while cloaked without being able to be tracked by enemy sensors. The older style Mark Ones restricted the vessel to impulse power only when the system was active, however. The Romulan vessels that employed the Mark Ones were themselves virtually blind while cloaked, as the high power usage required by the device made using sensors or other systems extremely impractical in most instances. Much advancements had already been made by the Romulans at this point, however, as they had started developing the much better Morphian Mark III and Mark 3.1 systems, uh, which did not share with the Klingons. It is known that cloaking technologies have existed in the galaxy for some time. However, in the affairs of the major Alpha and Beta Quadrant powers, the technology only started to come into use in the 22nd century. Mm. It is known that the Federation was banned from developing cloaking systems for larger scale employment on starships and facilities by the Treaty of Algeron in 2311. This decision was based on the fact that Starfleet is a peaceful organization and the use of a cloak is not necessary for peaceful exploration. Many in Starfleet considered this a huge blunder by the diplomats responsible for the treaty, but I think we will do an in-depth look at the Treaty of Algeron in a future video, perhaps, to maybe give some of you the facts on this treaty. So, Great idea. Absolutely. Um, some factions in the Starfleet did try to develop an interphasic cloak to somewhat skirt around this issue, however, as this was a loophole in the treaty itself, seeing how there's no mention of an interphasic cloak anywhere in the treaty. But this project ultimately failed miserably, as we know from TNG. Yeah. Eventually, the USS Defiant was allowed to use a Romulan cloaking device, but only under special permission by the Romulan government, and only in the Gamma Quadrant for surveillance and observation, and then only 
with the Romans being informed of the circumstances. This uh, concession, however, was violated on a number of occasions by the Defiance crew, blatantly, without thought, and without any repercussions. That was a very minor plot point that was forgotten quite quickly. <laughs> it, it, indeed, indeed. <laughs> Um, many, many races and species use different versions and variations of cloaking screens with different effects and technology. To get uh, into them all here would take forever, mm. however, so we've pretty much stuck with the Romulans and Klingons as they are the major powers that we do see. Many other versions of cloak have been experimented with or discovered over the years, such as interphasic cloak, mm -hmm. dark matter cloak, transmorphic mm. cloak, and even the tantalus mask employed by the First Federation. But to describe them all here would be rather time consuming. So maybe some future fact files mm. on each individual ones may be in order because they're yeah. kind of bite sized little segments. Love it. I mean, Pseudobun as well. Pseudobun and Cloak. There's also yeah. other variants. Mm. Yep. As mentioned, however, we have focused on the Romulans and Klingons in this episode. So now we proudly present to you a list of the cloaks developed by these races and discuss each briefly. So earlier, we discussed the Mark I cloak. This was originally used on early Romulan warbirds only. It used electromagnetic radiation shielding quite effectively to cloak only visible and near-visible radiation. This version can instantly cloak and decloak, but required large, substantial amounts of power, making these versions quite limited in what the vessels could accomplish with it activated. The Mark II cloak was a major improvement over the Mark I. This device cloaked all electromagnetic radiation except high energy gamma rays. It could instantly cloak and decloak, but was remarkably inefficient. These were the cloaking devices supplied to the Klingons by the Romulans during the Treaty and Technology Exchange of 2267, and was known to be employed on Romulan scouts and warbirds, as well as the Klingon D7 battle cruisers and later joint Romulan Klingon scout class birds of prey. The Mark III was the very first gravity-distorting cloak. The early prototype craft had problems with energetic effects occurring inside the cloak as a result of trapped thermal emissions within the cloaking field. This was overcome by giving the vessels a green coloration. This it tuned the thermal energy to a frequency where it could leak very slowly through the cloak without revealing the ship's presence, and is still common practice on most cloaked vessels. This early Mark III had only a spherical field setting and could not be effectively wave mapped. It could not instantly cloak or decloak, but saw much use on Roman vessels and the larger, newer versions of the TOS style bird of prey. The Mark 3.1 cloak was improved to feature instantaneous propagation of the spherical cloak and first saw use of the wave map cloaking system. It is reported to have been used in the same vessels as the Mark III and as a later upgrade by the Klingons for the D7, or by this point, Katinga cruisers. The green coloration was necessary and easily explains the Klingons' shift in their ship's color palette from gray to the darker olive green over the years. I didn't know that was the reason. I love it. To, that's the wonderful reason. It makes perfect sense. you got the Katingas, which go with the green, and then it's just all the way up through TNG. Yeah, it, the, they just went to aggressive warlike with cloak and tech, and yeah, absolutely. Next is the Mark 3.2. Not 4, we're going 3.2. This was the introduction of the fine-tuned cloak using special dedicated computer systems. This device uh, is believed was first created by the Klingons, in fact, but required large power reserves. The Romulans later reworked the idea into a more efficient form, originally designated the Mark 3.2. Hey, uh, the old cloak is still in active service on older Klingon vessels, however. Eventually came the Mark 3.3 cloaking system. This latest version allowed for far less power consumption and a more refined and enhanced power allocation of subsystems. These are fitted, as far as we know, on Romulan to Derodex style warbirds only. Uh, the Klingons still claim to only utilize the 3.2 A's, but who knows? And lastly, the experimental Mark IV cloaking system. This system utilizes a highly wave-mapped, adaptive, asymmetrical dispersion pattern. This cloaking device's cloaking generator coils are equipped with field actuators that change the dispersion pattern to be most effective in any interstellar condition, considering many variables, such as gas density, electric and magnetic fields, and fluctuations in the subspace domain. These field actuators compensate for any of these variables or active scans in the vicinity of where the cloak ship is being probed. There's no real danger of a spatial ripple occurring. This would render a ship undetectable, except with tachyon heterodyne detection grids, which, if powerful enough, would detect a ship that was cloaked in this manner. 
Many other such special instances of cloaking devices have appeared over the years. Primarily, General Chang's secretly developed bird of prey called the Dakrad Hon that could in fact fire while cloaked. While not really explained how this was accomplished, we can assume that the software safety protocols were removed from the computer's firing program to allow the firing of only torpedoes while cloaked. It is speculated that the photon torpedoes being fired were also configured to specifically match the quantum signature of the cloaking envelope, allowing them to pass through without being scattered or affected in any way by the ship's quantum scattering field. It is known that this ship had reduced capability to mask certain emissions as a result of redirecting energy to the firing systems, however, at time of fire. And as a result, could be detected if sensors were calibrated to look for a specific plasma emissions. This ship can in fact have shields raised also while cloaked, but General Chang was uh, so arrogant he did not raise the shield, assuming there was no possible way for his vessel to be detected. Wow. Klingon arrogance shining through Always again. Always eh? have your shields up if you can, guys. Come on, yeah. learn your lesson. Jeez, yeah. learn from Chang, guys. Learn from Chang. I think it was. I think he was thinking to be very Shakespearean to have your shields down and defeat your enemy without your shields active. And mm -hmm. I don't know. He's yep. that that kind of warrior. Next would be Shinzon Semitar, which had what was described as the perfect cloak in 2379. This new cloak did not give off any tachyon emissions or residual antiprotons, which rendered it completely undetectable while cloaked. It also allowed for the ship to fire weapons and use full shields while cloaked, as well as the ability to drop the cloak in specific quadrants of the ship without decloaking the entire vessel. This was done by having a specifically designed and dedicated cloaking emitter grid embedded in the hull in addition to the standard deflector grid used for defensive shielding systems. To allow for more power, the cloaking systems were individually powered by having their own dedicated power assembly that was completely independent from the primary ship's power systems. And as in the case of Chang's Bird of Prey, all weapons, not just the torpedoes, were finely tuned using the same computer responsible for the cloak to identically match the quantum signature of the cloak being generated. The ship was even able to travel at top warp speed while cloaked, and that top speed was in fact faster than the Federation's sovereign class vessels. As we saw in the movie, he was catching up to them pretty good. Mm. And that is it, guys. Just pretty damn in-depth look at the cloaking devices. Thank you so much, Stuart, for what is an amazing amount of research here. I've learned so much and put it all into context, honestly. So thank you. I hope you guys learned something. And I'm they'll have a trek yards. I learned a hell of a lot, so that was good yeah it was it was fun researching this as usual learned a lot myself and uh yeah the techno babble it, it hurts <laughs> sometimes yeah. just getting through it is a little rough this one wasn't too bad but yeah but i've, I've learned that i want the mark 4a the shinzon version because there that really is a, a, a leg above but i'm sure we can talk about that at a, a separate occasion and hopefully you guys liked the episode as well. If you did, please like the click the like button. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. As always, share it around. Tell everybody you know. Go scream it on the rooftops. Trek Yards is a thing. Watch it if you're a Star Trek fan. And I mean, th uh, that'll those, help those, us out quite a bit. I mean, those, 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 you know, talking to... Uh, megaphones. Like, well, megaphones, like yeah. 10 bucks. Or well, to be fair, you could just donate the 10 bucks to, to Trek Yards on Patreon, which would be great. Or one-time donation at trekyards.com uh, if you really want to support the show fully. I mean... That was so much research and, and all this editing comes in to you guys to generate the best, most informative piece possible. But it takes time. Time takes energy. Energy takes, you know, this is this is what we love doing, guys. We need your support. So if you can, donate. If you can't, like Stuart said, just shed everyone, you know, uh, that thinks we enjoy this. And I've learned so much. I think they would too. So please share. And that is it for this week's episode. So until next time, guys, don't be cloaked so we can see you next time. I get it. I don't know. That was really bad. Well, I, I, but... I, think a, I think a cloaked viewer doesn't count as a view on YouTube. So if you've got a cloaking device on, it doesn't see, count as a view for us. So we need that. Yeah, you got to decloak by hitting the like button. That's what you got to do. Because otherwise, subscribe. it's like you were never here. Subscribe is raise shields. And if you know from Chang, you've got to raise shields. Do these things. And yep. until next time, guys, I'm Captain Foley. I am Commander Kungs. And we will see you next time. Because no cloaking shields. Bye, guys. <laughs> Can't see me. Am I invisible yet? Now I'm invisible. Ha ha ha. How'd you do it? Bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs>